Welcome everyone. My name is Maggie Conglin and I'm a member of the Kellogg Alumni Relations team. Before we get started in a few moments, we wanted to let you know that all attendees will be muted throughout the presentation. However, we encourage you to participate by asking questions at any time via the Q&A icon that's located at the bottom of your screen. Today's program will last about 60 minutes. Dean Cornelli and Ada Osakwe will have a conversation and address audience questions throughout the discussion. And finally, today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on Kellogg's YouTube channel next week. On behalf of the Kellogg School of Management, thank you again for joining us today. With that, I will turn it over to Dean Cornelli to get us started. Hello, everybody. This is our uh, uh, final session uh, for this year because we intend to go on uh, because the conversations with Distinguished Alumni Series has been an incredible uh, success. Uh, it's been uh, such a privilege for me to uh, uh, inter uh, interview amazing visionary alumni and discussing uh, you know, trends in their industry and how they coped with, uh, with the COVID crisis. And I am so delighted that our closing speaker is Ada Ozakwe, who's been also the convocation speaker of a class of 2020 graduates. Uh, if you, I, I'm sure somewhere online you can see it, it was the most amazing and inspirational speech ever. I got so many emails from, from the students who were so happy about it. So it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. So it's just the perfect one to also close for this year the conversation uh, series. And uh, really, you know, uh, Ada, again, uh, you know, represents really the Kellogg spirit, the passion in throughout her career and the Kellogg values. Uh, she's uh, worked for a private equity based in New York, investing into Africa for funds. She's worked for the Africa Development Fund. She became a senior investment advisor to the Honorable Minister of Agriculture in, uh, in uh, Nigeria and then left it all to become an award-winning food entrepreneur and founded Agrolay Ventures, which is an, uh, um, an investment for focusing on early stage uh, innovative food companies. One of them is the Nuli Juice Company, which is Nigeria's fastest growing farm to table beverage producer and fast casual restaurant chain has been incredibly fast growing, but also has faced the, the challenges of the COVID crisis. And actually, I've seen Ada interviewed several times on CNN. So that means uh, I'm competing against uh, Richard Quest on who's the best moderator. I will ask after her. She's obliged to tell me I'm much better, but uh, anyway, uh, she's been recognized by Forbes Africa as one of the top 100 Africans contributing to economic impact on the continent, Forbes 20 youngest power women in Africa list. Anyway, this is, this is exactly why we are so proud to showcase our alumni. So welcome Ada to this, uh, to this series. It's such a pleasure to be here, Francesca. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, <laughs> no, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Let me start with uh, uh, some question. But uh, you know, I uh, all of you, please uh, uh, feel free to start asking question, and I will weave them in with the uh, the rest of the question. Now, I mentioned a bit your career, right? Really, you know, very broad, very different roles, very different type of things. Can you talk a bit more about your path and how also Kellogg influenced your approach to leadership in all these type of different roles? Sure. Um... You know, I definitely an unconventional path. I always say that I'm one of the few people who have maybe done public sector, private sector entrepreneurship, quasi public, you know, sort of everything together. Um, and, you know, it started off a journey as a young girl in Nigeria. Um, Nigeria is the largest um, economy in Africa and the most populated as well. Um, started out here and decided sometime when I was about in my teenage years to go for university in the UK. Um, while I was there, then ended up going into um, investment banking in London. 
at some point I got to meet the folks from the African Development Bank who were pitching their bond issuance. So they were going on a roadshow in London and one of the ladies who was the treasurer, she was like, you're Nigerian, why aren't you in, at the African Development Bank? And that's what really got me interested and intrigued. And I basically applied for their young professionals program. I ended up moving to Tunisia, um, that's in North Africa. Um, very interesting experience. They speak French and Arabic. I'd never done any of those. So I had to basically ad adapt. But I think I was the youngest hire at the time at the African Development Bank. The ADB is like the World Bank. Um, so it's a development institution that invests across Africa. It, this really got me excited about the continent. Working with the African Development Bank, I think, shaped me in many ways in terms of understanding the issues on, on, in Africa, the problems we have, the problems we face, and how um, the, the power of capital and how capital can help change that. Um, I worked in the investing team in the treasury, investing in bonds, um, and then moved on to private, um, the private sector team. And this was where the action was. This is where we're actually deploying capital and investing in infrastructure, infrastructure projects, building roads and all of that. And you know, Dean Connell, at that time, I then started getting a bit antsy because I was like, okay, I'm getting close to the development of the continent, but we're still having to go pitch our projects to a board that had like 70 different countries, both African and non-African. And I just suddenly started feeling like I'm having to make the case for development in Africa every single time. You know, you say you want to do a hydropower project. They say, oh, you're going to kill the flora and fauna. But I'm like, we need power. We need light. Like right now, they might take light in my house right now. <laughs> there might be no power. And, you know, it's just what we face. Um, so I started getting quite disillusioned with the with the mandate of institutions like the African Development Bank, like the World Bank. And I said, how can I get closer to actually making my own impact? And that's what made me decide to go do my MBA and transition um, to Kellogg. I still remember my essay for Kellogg was I wanted to go into private equity. Then I started feeling that private equity was closer to the entrepreneur, closer to development. Um, interned with Actis, one of the biggest emerging market funds. And then after business school, um, after a few months, I then joined a firm, like you said, in New York. Um, it's interesting that that transition then happened again, that I started feeling a bit uncomfortable. Um, started feeling a bit disillusioned with the way private equity was being handled in Africa. I felt a lot of people were raising big funds, driving nice cars, wearing nice suits, um, but not enough money was being deployed to the areas that um, actually would make a tangible impact um, in people's lives. Uh, so eventually um, decided to move home after a nice conversation with a few people saying, I wanted to still work in development and be closer, but I want to still be quite relevant in private sector and still having the hard skills of you know, going on a spreadsheet and looking through an investment. So that balance, and someone eventually um, told me that the Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria was looking for a senior investment advisor. But it was interesting that the, the position was being funded by a private entity. So it was almost like a secondment because they knew that to get talent, like Kellogg talent, it would be difficult to pay um, if I was to get the money from the, the government as a civil servant. So I was paid by the Tony Elimeli Foundation. Um, and I still remember that meeting. I was in New York, took a day off and took the Amtrak out to New Jersey, um, New Jersey and had this meeting. No, actually went to DC. So I had this meeting with the minister. It was the final stage of the interview. And what should have been like a 45 minute conversation became a three hour conversation. I just felt he was an amazing person. And I thought, who is this minister talking about investments? And he's an agriculture scientist. How does he know stuff about investments? And how am I going to help build private capital, bring cap private capital into agriculture in Nigeria? And before that time, I had never done much. And I decided to join and moved home to Nigeria. So yes, that was my path in terms of four more, four more career paths um, before I then transitioned into entrepreneurship that I guess we'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Yeah, actually, you know, I just got a question in which was exactly what also I was going to ask you, which is exactly that, right? And you left the senior role in government yes. to become an entrepreneur. Did you yes. always know that you wanted it, or I see now no. what spurred you to jump into entrepreneurship? You know, it, that was a, that's a very interesting question because, you know, I, I still remember being at Kellogg and definitely doing all the new product development classes and how to launch a business. And, but I never, honestly, if I knew that I would be going into entrepreneurship, I would 
have made sure I did the classes to get my, my classmates to do my business plan for me for free. <laughs> All those classes we did that we had to do business plans. And, you know, um, so no, I didn't know. But um, it's, it's quite interesting. It just sort of came nat naturally. I feel like if you are a person who is always so, um, so passionate and so uh, driven for, to see things better or to see change in the way you, you envision that change to be, no matter what, I feel we'll sort of find our way in eventually doing it ourselves. And that's really what happened with me when I was in the ministry, that's when I realized Nigeria was spending over $11 billion annually importing food that we could otherwise produce at home. It meant that our farmers were staying poor um, and while farmers in other countries were nice and rich as they imported food to our country. So we were food insecure um, and, people, and there was poverty. And I saw such a huge opportunity because we're the largest producer of pineapples in Africa, the largest producer of citrus fruits, largest producer of cassava, so many things that if we just spend the time industrializing that agriculture, adding value to it and processing the tomatoes into ketchup or into tomato paste, um, we could then feed the demand um, and the consumption locally. So I, I really got obsessed with how do we change this because agriculture again for me was a way to to still, and especially investing in agriculture, to still do the things I love, looking for projects, investing, and, and analyzing deals, but you know that everything we're doing across the value chain was making an impact on lives. And that's why I think I finally stuck with this sector after doing all the infrastructure finance, trading bonds, and, and private equity. So that's how I really went into it. It's interesting. And actually, there's a question here, which is a good follow-up to what we were talking. It says, what values do you always look up to when making business or investment decisions? Wow, that's a deep one. Um, I, I, and I think the first thing that comes to my mind is integrity. It's just ethics, integrity is huge for me. I am just a person of my word and I just want to look out for, for potential investees who, who do exactly what they say they would do or who are honest in their dealings in business. And particularly being in a country like mine, I still remember um, what I went through when I had to transition from government. Nigeria is known to be a corrupt place, so you can't go into government, you'll be tainted, you must have stolen money. So I go in there and I know I didn't steal money, but you leave and people don't believe you didn't steal money. So there were all sorts of rumors, Ada, oh, she did the deal for $2 million, oh, Ada is a rich woman now. And it was a very difficult time. Um, because that was such an important thing to me, my reputation, my, my name, my integrity. It's, it's one of the biggest values. And at first when I, I remember hearing it was maybe just amongst the civil servants in the public service saying it. And I was like, yeah, they would say anything they want because they just, because I stopped them from maybe, you know, taking that money. But by the time I got a friend of mine, who was a partner at McKinsey. And he says, Ada, we had a dinner, we went out for drinks. And he said, Ada, what am I hearing? Then I got so worried. Um, but what did I do? I just put my head down and built my company from scratch. Um, people saw the struggle. People saw as we built brick by brick. They saw as in 2016 when the government demolished my first store in Lagos flat to the ground and, you know, people set up a fund online to pay and all of that. So they saw that entrepreneurial struggle. Um, and I think that's what helped to build it back. So that, that value of your name and integrity is one of the biggest things I look out for. That is actually a fantastic message, how you could stick to your values despite the rumors and, and you know, just focused on what you were doing. That is very important. Now, let me talk, this must have been a, yeah, a difficult time, but right now also, right? You're, it, it is a difficult time. I just want to talk a bit about the exactly crisis management, if you want, aspect. The way that AgroLay Ventures is really so focused on the food and agricultural system, the COVID arrives, and also other people from other countries that talked about, uh, you know, the impact on the supply chain, on the companies. What's been your experience? Uh, it's, been, it's been difficult because in one breath, um, food in my country, as well as many countries across the world, was, is considered an essential service. 
So ideally, according to the book, we should be able to sell, we should be able to operate. Um, but then you have problems from the consumer, the demand side, where people are still, for my, for my restaurant, for example, where people are still quite um, scared about where they're eating, they're scared about the disease, so they're not, they're not buying. So we had to, thank, thankfully, we were already very big on using technology to enable our business. So we had an app that was just launched even before the pandemic. You could order our food and we deliver. So, so it was okay to be able to transition into sending food out. But then you talk about the, the other side of things of the supply chain, the, the, the upstream side. And you, you have a situation where I'm in an urban center and in the rural areas is where we typically farm and where there's land and most of our smallholder farmers are. And we buy from farmers. And suddenly we have a situation where because of the lockdowns and the states all impose different lockdowns, our farmers couldn't get their products out. They couldn't get their harvest to the city. We're an essential service. We need to move, but you have all sorts of roadblocks and people wanting to collect bribes on every single level. Um, so suddenly if you do get anything out, the prices have doubled because the costs have gone up. Um, so logistics was a big issue or continues to be a big issue um, that's affecting the agriculture supply chain and affecting our business. Um, so how we, have we thought differently? Um, my portfolio companies, we have one logistics company that was a bit affected, but they're sort of getting back on track. We have mostly the agri businesses. So whatever the case, agriculture is quite, and food is quite defensive. And that's why I like the sector. Um, but then I have done actually two more investments in this period. One was in an urban farm um, and they use like hydroponics and technology and for the trading side, they use blockchain. For the farming side, they don't use much soil, they use precision farming. And for me, that was such an interesting investment because it was like, yeah, okay, even within your own country, you could be, and where there's food available because of these lockdowns, suddenly in the city, we're food insecure and, and we're at risk because the food can't get to us and there's not much, not much farming land here. So now this whole concept of city farming and putting your little bags of carrots and tomatoes and lettuce in your, on your balcony or your rooftop is quite interesting. And for that business to be able to service all the, the supermarkets and retail stores and restaurants, I'm quite excited about that. So it, it's, it's heightened the awareness the need for um, better food around and closer to home. So I, it's, I think it's quite interesting. So that's going to influence you, you're saying, also going forward. Yes. Even yes. beyond. That's very going interesting. Going forward. Yes. And because as you think about it, the most of the cases um, of deaths of COVID have been from people who had pre-existing conditions, typically related to to health on, and nutrition. And what we do is buy fresh food. We, we give you healthier food options through Newly. Um, so there's that heightened awareness. So we believe that that's, it's good tailwinds for the business going forward as people become more aware of the importance of better nutrition. Okay, so that's, that's very interesting. And, and how did it go your, your entire evolution? You're a bit talking about how you struggle, but like from the first days of the pandemic, you know, what were your priorities then and then a bit yeah. later? Yeah, no, it was, you know, like for everyone, um, Francesca, it was just a shock. I think for the first three <laughs> weeks, you're just in shock. You're not even thinking, oh, let me wear my business school Kellogg hat and think about what models to plot and no 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 for the first three weeks i think i was just in a daze yeah just okay how do we just is this really happening that sort of thing um <laughs> i remember doing a video that went semi-viral here of me we had just produced some of our juices that's some of our natural juices we had just produced a few of them um, because we do daily production and that's the day they announced that there'll be a lockdown so we had fresh juices, no one to buy them. So we did this viral video for folks to please buy 50% off and, and that created quite a bit of awareness. But my priorities at the time were really just about my, the people who work with us. We've grown to about 50 people um, within the team, slightly over 50. Um, more, more than half of them are just really, the not really the, 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 some of the poor, poorest people generally. So the jobs they have with Newly is, is really all they have for themselves and their families. So 
that was what was on my mind, uh, Francesca. How am I going to tell anyone that they can't um, be part of this company? Because although we could start opening our stores and doing delivery, a big part of our strategy was to be inside captive buildings. And we had about four stores. We have about four stores inside office buildings. So inside KPMG, um, their office here in Lagos, inside the stock exchange building, and just a few others. But they're not back at work. So those stores, the revenues have just gone out the door. And that means that those positions shouldn't exist anymore. So the first few, two months, it was just, I bought food packs. I told everyone that, look, I'm gonna try. We paid, you we were able to meet 50% of salaries and then complemented it with um, food packs, dry, you know, pasta and some other dry foods that they could take home and it could last for like a month for themselves and their families. So we got that to them. Um, and even though I know in my speech I, on Friday, I said how we're laying off workers. <laughs> because at the time I wrote the speech, that was the plan, but I still haven't been able to do it. I just have, it's, 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 I don't know what to do. So now what we're doing is one, one week off, one week on, and that way they still have a job and, and we, you get some, like I said, no, we didn't get any support from our government um, in, in, the, in the big sense of things. So it's just been kind of moving ahead. So that's been the priority. Now, what's the priority? Now it's like that I'm now better. I'm no longer in a daze. So it's like, okay, how do I get this done? Call people up. This is the time to start getting boosting investment in the company. So I have some of my existing investors who want to reinvest, put some money in. Um, I spoke to a Kellogg friend of mine who is in, this, in a similar space. And I said, look, what can we do together? Um, and we're just basically gearing up for another fundraise and, and just pushing the business in ways that I don't think I would have done before. So um, I'm excited, but we just keep pushing. <laughs> you have to stay positive. Absolutely. And there's a lot of questions coming, including messages like, Ada, we love you, the Latin ladies from class 2011, Sophia and Lorena. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> Now, I have also a proper question, which is, um, in hindsight, what are the one or two most important things you have learned in navigating your career that you wish you had known much earlier? Oh, these deep questions from Keller grads. Oh, come <laughs> on, guys. <laughs> oh, you're too smart. Okay, I have to think. <laughs> no, but thank you. I think it's a great, great question. Um... I, I just, what, have, what do I, th I, I think I, I would have liked to, going into, I'll just think of one thing, I just, what, however it comes to my mind, maybe going into government um, and coming with this view of, ah, I'm economics, I have two master's degrees, one from Kellogg, I'm here and I'm going to help, um, knowing how to deal with politics. I think no matter what we think about, we, we say we're business leaders. I think if we are leaders who want to make change, I don't think we can avoid politics. Even if it's not directly, one way or the other, you, you would have to speak out about issues that are affecting people. And indirectly, um, that's politics. So being, I wish I was better prepared maybe in my mind, of how to deal with um, certain things um, in relationships in public service. Um, I think that that's one of the big, one of the big things. I, I've never thought about it, but it just comes to mind now. Um, but obviously better prepared now is so many times it's experience that helps, nothing else. Yeah. It's only like you have to go through these things. And, uh, but yeah, that's, that's one thing. Um, what else? No, I, I can't really think of stuff. You know, I, Kellogg, if I bring it home to Kellogg and some of the things I learned that really helped me. Um, I, I think I, I, I've said this in the past, I'm not sure, but listening. I still remember being in group, group um, meetings and I know how I felt when, when I was talking and maybe it's my turn to talk about the case or whatever and you just feel like, people glaze out and <laughs> their eyes glaze over and they're not maybe listening. Um, and then getting the feedback as well from my KSA group that either 
you know, we did a 360 degree feedback and mine was, I think the one that I remember was about listening more, not just hearing people. And that I have taken with me throughout. And it, it's, it's just amazing in, in, in how that transforms relationships, teams, new relationships, negotiations, whatever. Just being very conscious about listening to other people um, a lot more than, than talking and talking. So yeah, I think those are some things. Yeah. No, I think those are two amazing messages, actually, very important going forward. So um, I just want to ask you a bit more also, Deora, you know, about the industry, right? You talked a bit like how you're doing now some investment, thinking about the future. So what do you think really in general, what would be the long-term impacts of this crisis on the restaurant industry? Is there anything good coming out of it? And also in general on the agricultural sector, right? Beyond the restaurant. Yeah. You know, um, it's a tough one because no matter how, no one has this crystal ball of this next normal, especially when you see those, I was just watching CNN and Fauci and everybody talking about the cases going up again. It's like, when is this gonna end? Um, so I think, and I, I don't know if there's a saying around when there's a, it takes about 20 days to form a habit. And now everyone's been doing this new normal of sitting at home to order your food or make your food at home. So I wonder if they would, if this goes on for the, the rest of the year and into next year, if they would feel comfortable coming out again to socialize. We are very social beings. I think we have the largest events industry in the world. People love partying in Nigeria um, and they love socializing. So one way or the other, I think we'll evolve that back to that. But for now, honestly, everyone just has to innovate. Get, if you're a fine dining restaurant, people are now creating nice boxes that have everything in the box and they deliver it um, directly to people's homes. Um, and, and we just have to get used to the fact that it's all about um, getting to folks from, from, a, from a distance standpoint. Agriculture will continue to do well. It's food and I think it's, I hope it's actually the blessing in disguise for, for us here. The fact that Africa had been importing over $40 billion worth of food that we can grow locally. And so we were net food importers. So maybe now that borders are closed, it's difficult, we can look inwards and do what we have to do ourselves and hopefully build an industry that, that will go global. That's what I'm trying to do with my business. Yeah. That's actually it's very important. And I wanted to ask you, right, because you've been, as you said, both in the public and in the private sectors, in every country now, everybody's saying how we'll do the recovery. Now, in Nigeria, by my understanding, is that food insecurity has always been a problem even before the crisis, right? But, and, and this has just been exacerbated. So what do you think the role the governments should have versus the private sector? How can we, you know, in, in Africa in particular? Yes. No, I think that without a doubt that the government needs to do a, a lot more in agriculture. Um, and to support our farmers. We, in Nigeria alone, I think we have about 10 million smallholder farmers. Um, the problem is that you look at other countries like the US, you have the farm subsidies, you have whatever, and there's always just very focused, very focused um, support to, to the farmers. But we don't have the same here and we just have to do a lot more. Of course, there are competing priorities. Everyone, if you speak to someone who is in healthcare, they'll tell you the same, or if it's education, they'll tell you the same. And that's why when we were in government, we pushed for private capital. Okay, government doesn't have to do everything. Set the policy, policies, create the enabling environment, um, and then let private sector do the rest and bring the capital. And that's what I really truly believe in. And that's what I've advocated for so long and we keep advocating. It's nice to see the investment that have gone into spaces that we, you know, while I was there, we did investment cases for tomatoes, for rice, for cassava, for pineapples, for whatever. And it's just so nice to see the products coming out now, or people telling a young person, instead of going into banking, is telling you they want to become a farmer or they bought land to start farming rice. And why not? The opportunity is huge. You have such a, a, a huge market that of consumers ready for you 
and you know the the ROIs are amazing. So. So I think that's the balance. It has to be a public-private partnership in many ways, but the government has to provide the, the right environment, provide infrastructure, provide electricity and power um, so that it's not, it doesn't hinder the cost of doing business. Yeah. And actually there's a question here related to that, but says it seems that there is, there is a significant number of unique African crops that could bring value to Western market and how Absolutely. to drive the economic development in Africa. Is it Absolutely. true and what are the challenges? Absolutely, before? that's a part that's a personal, um, uh, personal passion of mine. I'm so passionate about things like, um, you know, you have hibiscus, it's in the, it's in the, it's in South America as well. They love the crop, but we have it here as well. It's one of our juices. Um, and I believe that it's something that would do very well because it's really good for blood pressure. Um, things like fonio is getting, gaining a lot of ground. It's a grain that's almost like quinoa, um, but even a lot more of a super food. And it's grown only in the Sahel region. So places in the North of um, West Africa um, so Senegal, Nigeria, and, and the Gambia, all these places. So, um, and that's gaining ground. So Fonio, um, you have tiger nut, which is with Lindy becoming vegan, um, folks who are lactose intolerant, we have tiger nuts here. And so, so there are a lot of crops. I completely agree that our superfoods, we need to look at our biodiversity a lot more and celebrate what we have here. At Newly, we've always had a no import policy at our, at our restaurant. Um, we celebrate and we use only what we have locally. We have something called cassa waffles and we use cassava flour because Nigeria, you know, 40 million metric tons annually of cassava we grow. We're the largest growers of cassava. That's yuca. They call it yuca in other parts of the world. So we use that cassava flour to make our waffles or like, okay, we're not going to use wheat um, that's imported from the US. We have this here, let's help our farmers. So we have to be a lot more deliberate about um, using what we have and what's, what could be a gold mine for us um, if we imported it to the West. And there's another question saying, given the proven sustainability of plant-based food, how do you see companies in the space forming part of your company's portfolio and their role in shaping the future of the food industry? Ah, I, I love that question. Folks, you guys are on point. You know exactly where my <laughs> mind is. <laughs> I, recently joined the board. I recently joined the board of a company called Infinite Foods and they basically are the sole exclusive distributors of Beyond Meats and some other big um, Oatly and some of the big plant-based foods um, in Africa. So they started in South Africa and now they're coming out to West Africa, starting with Nigeria. And honestly, it's really exciting what, what's going on. At first they started and they didn't think that Africans would consume meatless products, but honestly they sell out. Um, and there's always a shipment coming in um, this way. So I think it's going to be big. We, I think it's, it's going to be big. Um, from a diet related standpoint, from, from religious standpoints, and the fact that the food is tasty as well. I'm on a WhatsApp group that's, um, that's uh, vegans in Nigeria. I'm not vegan yet. I'm vegan curious. I try to be plant-based um, certain days of the week. Um, and I know the, the benefits there and the fact that there's a growing community, um, even here, I'm quite excited about when that company, um, and what I've been telling them is that, okay, I know you have these exclusive distributions with, with the top companies um, around the world, but how do we use what we have and how do we start investing in local entrepreneurs who are doing a, a new tiger nut based milk product or who are doing something with fonio and fonio flour, whatever. Um, and that's what they exactly what they want to do. So I think it's the future in many ways for food. And here one, which is a bit about the development, but less about not, not only agri agriculture. Someone say, have, given your experience, like in large public institution, banks, private equity, it says, where do you see the greatest need for driving the most impact and economic development? And how will this evolve in the next five to 10 years? There seems to be a gap between early stage startups and mature businesses owned by, P by private equity. How will that be best addressed? Francesca, I'm smiling again because 
everyone's on point with my mindset. You see, Kellogg, we have this connection in such a way. And I think that's the beautiful thing about the alumni base. And, and I always say it, I say it to the heavens, yes, um, we are really connected. Honestly, that's the biggest issue. And that's why I started AgroLay. I had done private equity. I was disillusioned, like I said, with the fact that folks were just focusing on uh, big tickets, specifically big tickets. They wanted to do only 50, $100 million ticket sizes. Um, and I'm like, but we don't have those companies. We don't have enough of them. You have new startups who want venture capital. So I feel like we, like, like the question, the person who sent the question, we, there definitely was a gap. We just jumped straight to private equity because everybody liked the sexy, you know, leverage buyouts and, and read and had read it's enough good, of yes. or whatever. <laughs> and rather than thinking of the context of where we were, and that's why I get very passionate about angel investing, um, passionate about small and medium enterprises and how do we really truly give them the capital and the support to become those businesses down the line. So there's not enough of it, not enough of it at all. Um, and I continuously work with folks. At, at some point I wanted to do a, start, do a fund separately for that. Um, but I have to pick my pick things at once at a time. But yeah, <laughs> there, there is a big need. We're still very early in venture capital. I think in 2019, Africa attracted only about a billion dollars in, in new venture deals. Most of it went to the fintech space. Um, fintech is a big thing um, for us here. Um, and you compare that to the US, that's still about, what's that, 130 billion or so, $135 billion in VC capital going in. So. So we have a we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go, but it's moving. It's moving. And you're part of that. That must be exciting, right? And it's I'm getting exciting. a lot of message about this. So it's inspiring. It exciting. One of the things I do try to speak up about is that I feel a lot of the, the tech, the venture capital money, the VC money has been going to tech. And I'm like, in Africa, there's still places that even if today I design a bicycle, something as basic as a bicycle, <laughs> and I say this bicycle is going to move this product from this village to that village and, you know, whatever, and it's going to make a lot of money because there's a need for that. I don't need tech. So many people feel like tech is, it has to be tech to be sexy and to have amazing valuations. And I'm like, we still have basic needs that some of the simple copy paste problems, but just putting it in the context of Africa or wherever you are would still work, but we don't get as much money. So I say if I was called newly tech or agrolay tech, maybe my valuations would be amazing, <laughs> you know? But for now I'm having to make the case why, you know, we have 10 stores, this is what we're doing, this is our revenues. But no, um, yeah, that, that really is, 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 is what's going on here. <laughs> yeah. But being, it's like, there's a question actually related to that, which says, ask that if, has technology still influenced your investment decision? So, as in, in terms of have I done it? I, I believe yes, 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 absolutely. Um, actually, I think the majority of the portfolio companies, Ace, um, I just did Shaka, and then the the urban farming one. They're all tech enabled. This okay, Shop Shop, which is an, a logistics. It's a Shop Shop Technologies. It's a logistics business that uses only technology. Um, and I think it's quite exciting for this market and the, the, what they're doing with, um, with um, anyway, with companies and services. So yes, in many ways it has, it really is the future. Tech is the future, um, but it's how we use tech in very um, specific, deliberate ways, not just for the sake of saying um, you have a business and because it's on your website or you put it on the website, it's suddenly tech. Um, let's really think through the right innovations and how we can apply technology to solve existing problems. And now there's a question specific about someone who knows Nigeria. It says, President Mohamedou Buhari and his predecessor, Good Luck Jonathan, has had programs to try to support Nigerian farmers through subsidy programs, but these have not been totally successful. If Nigerian agriculture does not develop more, will you try to create supply chains for your businesses with farmers in other nearby countries like Ghana and the Ivory Coast? So yeah, my former boss, um, Aki Adeshina, who is now the president of the ADB, he came with a lot of bold ideas and he implemented, he was the doer. So everything from giving 
our farmers inputs like fertilizers and improved seeds to yield higher higher crops and all of that was done but as as it is with our countries here when there's a change in government you, you have you have the, the phrase policy somersaults which is one of our biggest problems so you could start on a nice track that's taking you that way at some point our, our food imports had gone down to about three billion dollars um and suddenly you know policy somersault investors lose interest and and all the work we have done and to to get to attract investments all goes away companies like cargill you know we were they had come in we were having these conversations they brought their senior team and then it wasn't happening anymore so in Indeed, yes, if you have issues, I have explored, I've gone out to Ghana to explore and meet um, pineapple farmers there because pineapples is one of our biggest raw materials. Um, so, so yes, and it happens. It, 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 it already happens with a few people who are in the processing side that there's not enough um, coming from, from Nigeria, from our farmers locally, and, and they need to secure their supplies in better ways. So we have to look at neighboring companies um, countries. But for me, it's still a good thing, you know, as long as it's in it, for supporting the farmers in, in across the area. Absolutely, absolutely. And talking actually in the impact in Africa, there's a question that says here, what advice does ADA have for Kellogg alumni who would like to find ways to help make an economic and social impact in Africa, given the tremendous need and potential of the continent? Just come and do it. There's a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities. Um, some people decide to go through the development finance route, you know, DFID or IFC or USAID. There's impact there if that's, that's what works your boat. Um, but then you can become an investor. You can look up and work with entrepreneurs and advise them. I think there's still a big gap in the technical skills and advice. So uh, many entrepreneurs still need hand-holding. Um, so there's something to be said about having nice accelerators and very focused types of programs to ensure that we are building the, the, the next stars. And that's what I'm so concerned about. Let's support and let money go into the folks who are focused enough and they have interesting business models and become, become the next stars. And, and Kellogg grads can help with that, um, definitely um, can help with that. So yeah, lots of opportunities, um, public and private sector pick what um, works for you. I'm getting so many questions and messages. I'll have to give you all the ones I, I didn't manage. There's actually a request to have a case study about you to teach a Kellogg. So we'll have to do that. And we'll definitely have to do that. Because... Professor Jones, I don't know. I, I hope Matt is on the call from One Acre Fund. Um, One Acre Fund started by Andrew Yoon. Um, I sit on the board and it's so lovely to be on the board of, an, of other Kellogg grads and, and Matt, Matthew Forty. And Matt, um, I know we, there was a case last year that um, Professor Jones did of uh, One Acre Fund who deals works with the farmers and then knew it was a combined case. Um, so it was, a, it was a small case. It's a yeah. good one. Okay. So we already have one. We can explore one more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, mm -hmm. this is the question. It says, was there a time in your life that you thought your capabilities were not enough to the demands of your dream? How did you overcome it? I don't know about you guys. It's a great question. I don't know about you guys, but for some reason, maybe, I don't know if type A folks, I, I still have a lot of imposter syndrome in many ways, without a doubt. Um, so I, maybe that's what keeps pushing me and maybe it pushes you as well. So there are times I'm like, okay, am I enough? Am I doing enough? Um, there are many times, uh, but I don't dwell on it because I'm immediately reading up on it or calling out experts and speaking and getting to know stuff and being comfortable. So, so there's, I can't really think about a time that I would only say it's, it's happened at every single time because at every single time I felt, am I good enough? Am I really going to do this well? Um, and, and that really just makes me put my head down and just grind. So, so yeah, I, I want to say something about uh, something about Kellogg again on uh, that came to mind. One of the other big things I think I took away from Kellogg was the fact that we 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 learned so much. We were able to be deep in intense situations and more, and manage many things at different times. And 
So in one breath, you become this jack of all trades because you feel like whatever comes your way, I can deal with it. I can handle it. Um, so it's, it's a blessing, but I also think it's a curse. Um, as an entrepreneur today, it's, there are times I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't do it. Don't build that model. You don't have to speak to, you know, that sort of thing. Um, because you just want it done and you want it done quickly. And because we're so used to moving in that high intensity, uh, so, so yes, I have to hold myself because you know that whatever you do, even if you're uncomfortable, we, we get comfortable. We, 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 we've trained ourselves at Kellogg and after that to, to just get comfortable with uncomfortable situations um, because we just believe that we can do it. You know, just put your head down, whatever, you can do it. And that's how I've sort of moved. Well, you, you definitely exemplify, right? We always say that the Kellogg spirit is a low ego, high impact. So your answer is just spot on. Now, given that you mentioned the one acre fund, there's a question here related to that. It says, given that you are on the board of uh, the One Acre Fund, there is another Kellogg homegrown powerhouse organization. Have you been able to share and spread the best practices and learnings on how farmers are able to stay safe and be productive farmers during COVID? And apparently also the One Acre Fund is gonna have a virtual Q&A event on Thursday. Absolutely, and I'm sure they'll be best placed to tell you about that, but you know, I think Andrew and Matt are so excellent with, with us on the board and they spend time to, to just share. Um, they share their, their successes, they share what they're, they're afraid about, their fears, uh, network issues. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So absolutely. yeah, so I think I think I talk about the One Acre Fund. Yes, yes, that's, that's it. They're doing all they can. You know, because it's very interesting in Africa, um, it's very interesting. Many people, the, 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 the poor people, or the poorer people would say this, the COVID was a, is a rich man's um, disease. It's so funny. You know, they're like, ah, no, that's, it's, it's a rich man's disease. So there has to be so much education. We've done, you know, I've worked with teen folks who have done um, COVID sen sensitization videos in different languages. Because you have to think about the cultural aspects, the different languages, because we have like, over 200 yeah. ethnic groups and they all speak different languages. So, um, so what Wonder Fund is doing with the poorest of the poor is so important. Now, there's a several question about you as a woman entrepreneur or you as a woman in private equity and or you as a woman in Nigeria. So let's uh, let me start with one. This is what advice, I just says, thank you so much for sharing your inspiring story, Ada. What advice would you offer to women who someday want to launch their own fund and effect change through allocating capital? Wow. You know, just first of all, if you want to do it, kudos to you. I think that would be a very special thing. We need more women who are owners of capital. We need more women who are the providers of capital, period. Because we can't make change if we're not the ones if we're not the ones who are deciding um, what happens. So, so I think that, that, that needs to happen. Um, you just have to be bold about what you're doing. Know your stuff. I think I've always said that, and I'm talking to the converter, your Kellogg grads, just know your stuff and, and knock on those doors. You know, as someone who has invested as well as raised capital for my business, um, I've seen I've seen those biases. I have, <laughs> you know, when you're being questioned if you can you can meet certain targets or why are you raising this amount? You should raise smaller. I'm like, did you tell James that? Did you tell you know to come about that? You know, you didn't say that. So, you know, VC. I think the number is 0 .00, 0 0.002 percent has gone to women, um, or about two percent has gone to women. But for black women, it's about 0 0.006 percent. Um, so we are even a lot more um, behind. So we definitely, definitely, if you can, please go out there, but join groups that are supporting women. Um, there are a number of funds who are very focused on only women, um, women founders and women focused funds. So please be become part of those um, groups. There's some, some networks that only do help women in boards. So they open up doors as well. And there's always strength in numbers, I believe. But speaking on the women issue, if you allow me, um, Francesca, yes, over, the last few, over the last few days, there was some press 
in, in, in Nigeria about my speaking at the convocation and, and being a first African to speak. But one of them, I'm just looking at one of the things that one of the companies put out a, John, a, a paper that says, pretty Nigerian lady breaks record, <laughs> becomes, what has pretty, how has pretty added anything to that, sent, that, that headline, you know? And it just, and there was a whole conversation about it on one of our groups and, and it's interesting. <laughs> so yeah, this is what we face. You know, I'm a woman doing my thing. Um, the person who asked the question, she, she knows, and that's why she's asking that question, that it's a tough world out there. You'd still be seen as a woman. And, and, um, but we just have to keep pushing through and break and crashing those ceilings. We do. We do. It's possible. Absolutely. No, no. And, and actually, I should have mentioned, exactly, you were our first African convocation uh, speaker, and it's a great honor to have you. I mean, moving on that is not, I mean, it's like other, some, there's a question, are there, are there other unique challenges in being a woman in business in Nigeria than if you were a Nigerian man in the same role? So not only as a, a capital allocation, but just also running businesses. Yeah. You know, I didn't really see it, um, or I haven't, I didn't overly see any big differences. I think, um, but then when you then open your eyes properly, you then realize, oh my gosh, you know, how come I wasn't invited to that meeting, or you need to put a woman on your board, and I speak out about it, so, so because I'm now a lot more conscious. So yes, there are differences in, in that regard. Um, but I think when I first moved home, especially when I went to government and, and just in general, we're still, women are still celebrated, you know, get positions here and there, we do, we do our thing. Um, but what I saw was issues around ageism and, and if you're young, um, you don't really get it, or people don't take you seriously, or they, they initially um, don't want to take you seriously, so you have to do the extra proving that you have something up here and that you're smart and you have value to add. So I think initially I felt the ageism thing a lot when I moved home. And then later on, you then start seeing that um, as I, as I got higher in my, in my career, stuff around board positions and stuff, we need to be a lot more diverse then. And I should mention, a message just arrived here, someone saying, they mentioned the 100 million new voices fund launched by Richelieu Dennis to support female entrepreneur. That's uh, So apparently there are things like that, yeah. uh, which are important uh, to move. Yes. Now I can see we are arriving towards the end. So I want to ask you one question because in the convocation, you said that behind you know, besides being African, you're a black woman. And so I just, you know, in this unique time we are having, you know, in the US, but also globally, right? If you would like to share a bit your thoughts on what's happening in the US now with the Black Lives Matter movement. And also what advice do you have for people who want to use their passions to fight racial injustice and make a difference in their communities? You know, um, Francesca, it's just, you know, I think I said we're, we're at a tipping point. Um, and, and, I, and the only thing that keeps me up at night as I think about what's going on um, is I just hope that if we that we must not lose this moment because if we do would we ever get a moment like this in time to finally break down those 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 um, walls of racial injustice so I don't want us to get tired I don't want the blacks amongst us to in the US um, to get tired or to get distracted or they shouldn't feel that if the, the media is no longer covering it, it doesn't matter, keep going, you know? So, so for me, that's it. I, I just don't want us to lose this moment um, to make change really happen, to, to ensure it really happens. Um, what advice do I have? It's just to speak up. I think that was my message last week, but I can't emphasize it enough. You can't say when it comes to putting it out or putting it on your social media, do nothing. You need more, it shouldn't be a situation. Um, so we just have to change because it is, it is, it is, um, it's just wrong. <laughs> we're human beings, we're all human beings. So I, I, I get emotional when I think about this because, you know, I'm here 
and you know, every day you're seeing a new video or something that's happening in the US and how a black man is treated, and it just doesn't make sense, not in these times. So I think it's our responsibility to speak up and change it because we can if we speak up, you know? Um, so that's my view, speak up. That, that is a great message to conclude. And I really want to uh, thank uh, Ada because, you know, every time I talk to her from the first time we talked, you know, it's like your po energy, your positivity, even in difficult time, right? Like uh, what's happening uh, in the US, which affects you clearly, you, you feel that, but also what's happening, you know, in, in Nigeria with the COVID affecting your business. I, I, these are amazing challenges, but every time I talk to you, you have such energy and positivity and wanting to make an impact. And I'm just, we are just so proud to call you a Kellogg alumna. And we are so proud for people to see what Kellogg alumni represent and, uh, and doing it. So um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for talking to everybody. And uh, uh, Thank you for all you're doing. Just keep being yourself and doing it. Thank you so much, Ada. And thank you everybody for joining today.